Pretty important stuff, Grant. Behind every blade, there's one of the biggest stories in the world. A story written on the face of your own land. You know, it's not big just because so much of the United States, about a billion acres, is in grass, hay, and forest range. Nor because growing grass for hay and pastures is old as farming itself. It's because we can't live without it. Where would we be without grass? From it comes the energy, which is the first need of animal life. All kinds of animals. And here, a big payoff. Grass into flesh. Grass from prairie, pasture, and mountain range turned into a business of millions. And behind each day's supply of meat, thousands of acres of grass. Grass processed into steaks, chops, hams, and broilers by the fine-feathered and four-footed friends of man. You'd be surprised how many people take all this for granted. Are there even farmers with the attitude that the only land they ought to put in grass is land not good enough for anything else? Well, sir, it may be news to some people, farmers and city folks alike, that we're losing too much of that billion acres and abusing what's left at a time when we need better land than ever. We've got to face some tough facts. Adequate defense, which can't succeed unless it's supported with food, fiber, and all the other farm products. Increasing population. Every day, 7,000 more people than the day before for the farm to feed and clothe. The need for exports to free nations. There's an answer in grass farming. And when I say grass, I mean grass and legumes. Now, here's what's going on. Improved grassland is bringing back the tired, worn-out soil of the east. Grass is pinning down the prairie. Grass is holding the mountains in place. In some parts of the country, pastures and meadows are feeding a cow and a half to the acre, giving two to six times as much forage as the old exercise lot. Dairyman report cows giving 8,000 pounds of milk above the national average for years in a row on just good grass as pasture, silage, or hay without supplemental feeding. Range we thought was gone for good is being made to yield two to four times as much as we ever thought possible. In some areas, cattlemen are getting as much as 600 pounds of beef to the acre. Other cattlemen claim their cattle make gains of over two pounds a day on nothing but grass, no concentrates, and are marketed in the choice grade after finishing on grass alone. Still others question these claims, but questioning claims is an old custom among farmers and experts. It's the way we progress. Who can say what's impossible in a country as big as ours? Why, the forage food value of some pastures is estimated equal to 135 bushels of corn to the acre, yet the land wouldn't grow good corn. On the other hand, an increase of 10 to 12 bushels an acre is reported on good corn land by plowing under legumes as green manure. And two or three times bigger yields of other crops have been recorded in rotations with grasses and legumes. The beauty of grassland is the way it saves the soil, makes it rich, and saves money for you at the same time. After the initial investment, costs go down, and you get a greater return for your labor. Here's how. Good range will cut feed costs for chickens, turkeys, and hogs. Grass is really going to market these days. A market for plenty of milk and meat. It's a healthy sign of the time. Means a better diet for everybody. More steady income for the farmer. In an experiment, a group of steers made a profit of $84 entirely on grazing. 
while a similar group could net only $48 from dry lot feeding. Here's something to think about, too. You can't wear out a farm in grass. But no matter what kind of a farm you have, you've got to treat grass as a crop. Plant it. Rotate. Select seed carefully. Fertilize. Manage grazing and harvesting. Control bugs and diseases. Exactly like anything else. There will always be an argument over exactly how much profit you can get out of grass. But I'm not talking out of a book. You know, there's a saying, what a man hears, he may doubt. What he sees, he may possibly doubt. But what a man does himself, he cannot possibly doubt. So why don't we go get the story of grassland farming directly from those best qualified, the farmers who've done it themselves. Meet Vassal Green in North Carolina. When I first took this farm, it was the poorest piece of dirt in the world. But I named it Green Acres. And I'd make it green. I crossed that field one year when the other man lives here, and you could have gathered an acre of corn in a gunny sack. The only corn he had was a few little nubbins on the terrace bank. The man that lives here before couldn't make a living. That was a, it was a typical cotton and tobacco farm. No grass, no clover of any kind. Depended on the merchants to supply his hay. That kind of farming is out. In 39, the farm security loaned us money to buy the farm, and they also loaned us money to buy a tractor. So we began a new system of farming with pasture grass and alfalfa, and as we went along, we bought more cows and equipment. A change in the financial system is one thing that helped me. The only thing we buy is four bags of soybean meal a week, and we're milking 35 cows. We've been seeing a lot of temporary grazing. You wear out your equipment, and that runs into a lot of money. So we are going to put in permanent pastures and then just use the mowing machine and let the cows do the rest. The only thing we've done to the pastures since seeding is to fertilize once a year and uh, lime and superphosphate. That's what makes legumes grow. Clip it. Keeps the weeds down. I don't have many weed problems anymore. If we have the water, we could have pastures all the summer. That's one thing we'd like to get into, irrigation. I believe if we kept them lined and fertilized, very fertilized, we wouldn't have to feed them ever again. He's over-optimistic there. Look how we brought back the soil here. Ryegrass soil speaks for itself. There's one thing about the livestock business. Land that gets so run down you can't make a living on it growing cotton and tobacco. You can make a living in the dairy business on land. That's what we did on this farm. I don't think anyone can stay in the dairy business anymore without good pastures. And it makes farming easy all around. We don't have to work 12 and 14 as much as 18 hours a day. Don't bother about getting up at 4 o'clock. We get up at 5 or 6, get the milk on the truck, come back, sit down, read the paper. Now let's look in on Clarence Kaiser out in the Midwest. Well, this was a wore out, washed out farm. Dewberry briars, blackberry briars, sassafras, and persimmons. And that's about what I had to contend with at the start. One day the mules ran away and wrecked my binder. I got out my account book and I found that I hadn't made enough one week in 12 years to buy a new binder. And right then when I got interested in grass. There's three things I could do. I could buy more land, or I could sell off my livestock that my farm could support, or I could make my farm productive enough to support the livestock which I already had. I couldn't afford to buy new land, and I hated to cut down on my livestock, so I had to see what I could do to boost my production. I talked to the county agent, so we put out some test spots to find out how much lime and fertilizers to use on our pastures. 
to my amazement, I found that where we used three tons lime and 300 pounds of superphosphate, we just had five times as much as where we had in treated. I don't hesitate to put on the fertilizer. It cost me about $12 a half an acre. My 78 acres furnished grazing for 300 head of livestock, mostly sheep. I sold $121 per acre for every third acre of land. This grass is doing wonders for my field. Now the soil has a loose texture, the rain can penetrate it, prevent runoff. When I first got to farm, if you wanted to go fishing and wanted an earthworm, they were hard to find, and should you find one, they were so small you could hardly stick them on a pin. But now you can almost string them on a spike nail. I rotate my cattle and sheep quickly. If you've got the right kind of equipment, you can get away from a good part of the labor problem. All the labor on my farm is done practically by myself. Now for haying, we use a jeep. We built this pole barn for hay. We just take our hay in and lay it down where we want it with the stacker. I've got a lot of money tied up in fencing, but I think the extra grazing will soon pay for them. Well, the problem still is keeping the farm balanced with the livestock you have and keeping grass in the rotation with other crops. You can take word out the land that won't grow 10 bushel of corn per acre and grow a wonderful crop of hay and pasture on it. It takes plenty of money, work, and time to go into grass farming. But when does the farmer get anything for nothing? Actually, the farmer who has a sound basis for credit, who wants to get started on the grassland program, can get a loan and help from his cooperative credit association. And you don't have to go all out at the start. Grassland farming can be worked into any farm plan gradually. Now, let's stop in on three farmers out in the corn belt. Wesley Kirkpatrick. You have to get a balance in there. You've got to know what you're going to get before you plunge into it. That's just the whole situation. Charles Kenny. Our corn and small grains converted into meat to go on the table. Somebody has to raise the meat, somebody has to raise the grain to feed them. It all boils down to this. In our American way of life, one fellow does one thing, one fellow the other. It works its way out. It always has. Cecil Ray. Every farm is a problem unto itself. We had about as many problems as any farm. We classified the soil all over the farm and came back with this map showing the different types of soil and a plan for farm usage of the different kinds of land and different fields. We rearranged our fields, part for pasture and part for four-year rotation. Things that we felt would build up the land and get the most production it was capable of giving. The first thing we had to tackle was a drainage problem. Land covered with willows, some cottonwood trees, was really the best land we had because a good deal of fertility on both sides had run down into the lowland. A group of 12 or 15 of us put up the money for a ditch through our land. We figured by doing this, we brought in 500 acres of idle land into cultivation. Our high ground that had been pretty badly eroded, we put into pasture, and we do not intend to put that in row crops again. I am sure that for every dollar expended for lime and fertilizer, we have received several dollars in return. We are surprised that the land can come back as fast as it has. I had some hogs years ago. My dad, who's 93 years old, was born on the place we lived on. We had those hogs out on alfalfa. We had corn, the feet are full of feed. Get those hogs to go out in the hot sun and eat that alfalfa. My dad said those hogs are crazy. I never seen hogs act like that before. 
They sure like that alfalfa. That's what we need in this country. Plenty of good grass for our hogs. This grassland we have here today makes us pretty near as much money as your farm ground. When you stop to figure, you take a good tight beef cow and turn her out on this grass. Now that cow will never need any grain. If your hay is fertilized, she'll come out in the spring nice and fat. You turn them out on pasture, they'll drop their calves. Now I don't think you can make more farming with the amount of fertilizer you have to on, labor's high as it is, and all that on any land. If our population keeps up, we're going to have to raise more per acre. Now that's where education comes in, to produce every ounce you can on that piece of ground and keep the fertility up. Well, I think the thing here is, if times come bad when crops are not profitable with the ground as it is, we can raise grass, we can raise beef, these cows will make us a living. Now pick any method you like. And if emergency comes along, you can always change over. Of course, no two farmers will draw exactly the same conclusion. Take seeding practices. One thinks the only way to plant alfalfa is by band seeding. The hookup drops the seed back of the disc directly above the fertilizer. This, along with shallow seeding, saves seed and assures better stands. Another's favorite method is drilling rye in rotation pastures to furnish extra grazing in late fall and early spring. Those who want seed from their legumes make sure there are plenty of bees around. Take soil building. Many believe there's nothing like plowing under legumes for green manure. Some swear by manure as the only way to put organic matter into the ground. Consider fences. They depend on the locality and the materials available. Look at the different systems of harvesting and preserving forage. To do this at the most nutritious stage of maturity, farmers will have to follow different methods, not only in different parts of the country, but at different seasons on the same farm. Now your neighbor may be trying a trench silo. Some say it's cheaper than baling hay. On this farm, they're not even curing the crop of alfalfa, ladino, and brome grass. No hold up in the harvest on account of weather as long as the equipment can get around the field. Silage has the advantage of efficiency in preserving nutrients. Hay has the advantage of ease in storing. A man with more alfalfa than he needs for pasture or silage can convert it into cash by marketing his crop as meal or as hay. Well, let's go farther west. Nearly half the land offering natural vegetation good for grazing in the United States lies west of a line running down the middle of the Great Plains. But more than 600 million acres of this western range need improvement. Grazed out. Burned out. Drowned out. thrown away, but such things don't have to be. and mesquite, all together over 80 million acres of brush, which has crowded out the grass through abuse of the land, can be controlled in some places by spraying, in others by plowing, the range 
can be reseeded. More than 15 million acres have already been successfully sown with grass and legumes from the desert to the mountain. And some native grasses will come back by themselves when given a chance. Miracle in itself, out here can be grown the seed we need to patch the whole American earth. Getting back what we started with means stocking only as many head as the range will support, giving parts of it a rest every few years. Call it management. Make the cattle spread out over the range for even grazing by developing a well-distributed water supply. By placing salt licks away from the water. By putting back rubbing devices away from the salt licks. And by making the stock time their own supplements with a salt meal mixture in self-feeder. On the western range, there's a cycle to be maintained in the movement of cattle and sheep for forage through the four seasons. Winter in the desert valley. Spring and fall in the foothills. Summer in the open forest range higher up. To the mountaintops themselves, source of the gift, water. The water which is everything. Bringing and keeping the grass as the grass holds the water, a commodity worth five to ten dollars an acre in these parts. A gift tied up with inescapable mathematics. So many head per acre, so many months per year. So much meat for so many people. The greatest good of the greatest number. Start with the chewed off mountain. Hold the water for the soil. Hold the soil for the grass. For the grass will be flesh. I ought to remind you wherever you live that man has competitors for grass. I'll introduce just a few. Worms. Aphids. Little bug and other bugs. Grasshoppers and grubs. But the competition can be met and controlled by the same care which goes into the protection of other crops. I ought further to warn you that there's still some unanswered questions. Why do certain grasses and legumes disappear in some seasons? What's the best method of storing solids? What are we doing to improve the technique of soil testing and broaden our knowledge of fertilization? What combination of grasses and legumes will do the most for us? Why not get the answers from an expert? Dr. Philip V. Card, an American pioneer in grass, some call Mr. Pasture himself. Well, there has been a great deal of progress in grassland agriculture in the United States during the last 20 years. This has been due to experience and to scientific experimentation. But we have not yet applied all that we know. And there is a great deal still to be known. Fortunately, scientists are at work in all states, applying to the problems of grassland agriculture, all of the sciences. They recognize many problems, but they are focusing their attention upon three major problems. Breeding for the improvement of grasses and legumes, which are so essential to good pasturing for the improvement of management of the sward, taking account of soil, climate, insects, diseases, 
and other hazards to the maintenance of good sward. Then they are interested in utilization, seeking to preserve in the harvesting and storage of the fodder those nutritional qualities which are so essential to livestock feeding. All of these scientists at work seek to conserve the soil, sustain fertility, ensure feed supplies, and ensure adequacy of food and fiber in quantity, quality, and variety for all our people in an expanding population. This means permanency, and a permanently productive agriculture is essential to national welfare. There's a big job and a big opportunity in grassland agriculture for everybody. Over the nation, only a small fraction of possible good pasture has been improved, 10% or so. On the individual farm, one acre of improved pasture can be made to equal two acres of unimproved pasture. How do we know? We know from the results of practices which have always been the mark of a good farmer. Fitting your farm to the land. Planning and managing. Making a plan for your crops and practices. A plan for working grass and legumes into rotations with other crops. A plan for balancing feed with your livestock. Rotating, figuring how many heads you can graze and where they are to graze each season figuring how much hay and feed grain you will produce and how to feed it. A plan for the best use of your capital, estimating costs, taking into account how much you have and how much you can safely borrow. Estimating returns and how long it will take to get additional returns from your investment. On farms which have low yields, insufficient feed, low production per cow, and too much land in row crops, a program of increasing grass and legumes for pasture and silage, and in rotations with other crops, a program of renovating permanent pasture, and of increasing fertilization, a program which will allow an increase in livestock, will pay, will pay more in proportion, even with slightly higher costs. The old frontier is closed. We Americans are late in learning that there is a limit to natural resources. But grassland farming is a frontier open to every American farmer. A system of farming in which grasses and legumes are used in balanced proportions for silage, hay, and pasture, for soil improvement and conservation, for high production, and for profitable farming.